Now I'm perfected. How am I going to do the work of the ministry? Well, what's that? And you say, oh, well, Paul happens to tell you, here's the ministry model. And that's where that's the progression. And some of you, you know, you've been with us all along through that. But we've worked through those things. Now, as you're going to go out and do the work of the ministry, there's a context, there's a world you do it in. Second Timothy 4, verse 2, he says, preach the word. We love that, don't we? Be instant, what? In season, out of season. You need in your preaching of the word to have the capacity to know what season you are in. You see that in that verse? An understanding of the season that you are in. The culture you are in will have a seasonal thinking process to it. And you need to understand what the season, you need to know how to recognize what the season is. So that you know how to preach the word in, out, whatever the season is. Okay? That to me is probably the most critical issue that you're going to face in ministry going forward. You've heard me say time and again, we live, you are living right now in the most critical, exciting, decisive, important decade of your life. I don't care what your age is. Right now is that decade. If you're my age, you can look back and see how you got here. If you're young, some of you guys that are in your 20s and you look into the future, you're going to look back and say this, is the critical, this was the critical decision-making point where things changed. You can go along and not see that, or you can see it. I want you to see it. I discovered years ago, did, did, did you ever hear guys on the radio that said, I made $2 million in the stock market in three months, and I'll show you my, my formula for doing it. So you send them the $100, you buy the formula, and does it work? It worked for him, but it doesn't work for you. Why? Because market conditions are different. If it was still working for him, he wouldn't be selling it to you. He would be doing it. If I can make a million dollars in three months, I ain't trying to sell you something for a hundred dollars. I'm doing that. It quit working. Now he's selling it. People do. They look to the past and say, oh, but you're going into the future. You look at church growth stuff. You look at people, how to, how to operate ministry, how to do the practical stuff in life. Fundamentalists, evangelists have been great about that. Who we did this, we did that. And they're always got people over here trying to produce what worked 30 years ago, but you're not going to live 30 years from now. I said last night, my wife and I were looking at a car the other day. This guy had shown off this new car. And she says, well, where's the cassette player? I'm, I'm sorry, the CD player. Doesn't have a CD player. And my dear wife, she, she looked at him, she says, well, then how do I listen to my CDs? <laughs> he said, well, it's got Bluetooth. You just get it off your phone. They aren't on my phone. And he looked at her like, you know, <laughs> that's a problem I hadn't come up against yet. <laughs> and, you know, a guy about 25 years old, he's all excited about tech. You guys that are young, you're living in a world that, that people like me don't understand in a lot of ways. But it's, gonna, it's ubiquitous to you, and you're not, you're not ever going to understand it. I've got eight-track tapes in there. You don't know what an 8-track player is. Some of you think, wow, that's a great innovation. You know, we've got reel-to-reel -reel tapes in here. We can't even get a reel-to-reel -reel player to play the thing. We've got big old phonograph records like this. You can't buy You can't get things to play. The technology is so different now. The message is the same. Technology is different. Some of you just live in that stuff. You know, come up with it. It's there all the time. My wife's phone not working the other day. She had a problem. I said, well, get your, you know, give it to Nathan. He's 11-year-old. He, he had it fixed in about three minutes. <laughs> And she and I spent a half hour reading instructions and couldn't figure out. Well, you understand that kind of thing. So the world you live in is different. How do you minister the truth in that world and do it understandingly so that it reaches? Not looking to the back. What's going to happen in the next decade is going to set the tone for the ministry in the future. And, and guys, the ministry you're going to have in the next 25, 30 years, you're going to have to reinvent the form. Form follows function. Never forget that. 
The form isn't the issue. The function, the spiritual life is the issue. But form has to follow the function. You don't build a box and say, Lord, jump in my box. You get the spiritual life going. You get the spiritual life functioning. And then you put a structure around it that allows it to function more smoothly, more efficiently. That's where form, that's form follows function. Religion, the vain religious system, sets up the, func- the, the form and says, here, function in our form. That isn't how it works. Romans chapter 13, verse number 11. Paul says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. I just want you to see that thing. Paul, the, the idea of knowing the time. You need to understand something about the times and the seasons in which you live. Now, I understand doctrinally what he's talking about. Here's the times of the Gentiles and, the, and so forth, the fullness of the Gentiles, the dispensational issues that are going on here. I understand that. You look at 1 Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 5, and he tells, you, he tells them, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk, no, I'm reading chapter 4. Somebody didn't correct me. When you do that, did I say First Thessalonians 5? Yeah. Well, somebody should have said, no, preacher, you're not reading that, right? You just let me read a whole verse without it being the right verse, and you just sat there like a sheeple. <laughs> it's okay. It's just Saturday morning. You're all among friends. Most of you are friends anyway. The guys that aren't your friends, go shake hands, hug the neck, and they'll just think you're weird. But they thought that to start with. Chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When you when you understand God's word rightly divided, you're going to know and understand where you are in history. You're going to understand where you are in the program of God. It gives you an ability to know. And I love the thing he says, of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write in for you yourselves know perfectly. You have, a, you have a complete understanding from God's Word to be able to look at what's going on in the world about you and know where you are in the plan, purpose, and program of God. You can know the times. If you go back to Matthew 16, come with me to First Chronicles. In Matthew 16, Jesus told told the Pharisees, it says, you know, you, you, you look at the sky and you can tell things about the sky, about the weather and so forth, and you can't read the spiritual, the spiritual times in your nation. There is an expectation for leaders to be able to understand where they are. First Chronicles chapter 12. Verse number 32. The children of Issachar which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. You see that? The understanding of the times has to do with understanding how to function in the time. How to, how to conduct the ministry in the time. And that's, that's the thing I'm trying to, try, trying to get at. In, in, in the prophetic program... Israel worked on a time schedule, Daniel 9. You look at the book of the Revelation. You look at the courses of judgment, Leviticus 26. You look at the, 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 the there, there's a time, and they had this, the times in the sea. They had all this stuff laid out for you. Now, in the dispensation of grace, God's interrupted that. And what did he interrupt it with? Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. He interrupted it with the dispensation of grace. He introduced the dispensation of grace to you through the ministry of the apostle Paul. So we know where we are today. We're in the time period in which God's ministry through Paul is what's the issue. Paul said, I'm, look with me, you in Romans? You know chapter 11, verse 13. Look back at chapter 1. Romans chapter number 1, verse 5. Just start in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, 
which he had promised to four by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. God has always had good news. And what you, when you come to the Apostle Paul's ministry, what you're going to do is you're going to get the final installment of what, the, what we call progressive revelation. God has been giving good news since Genesis 3.15. And he's been, he promised a redeemer. And he's been expanding on that good news. That good news became the, 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 the seed of the woman, became the seed of Abraham, became the seed of David, became the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we know that, that, that Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to bring salvation through, through Israel to the nations, that God had another purpose in Israel's Messiah. That is, he's going to be the head of the church, the body of Christ. There's only one Savior. There's only one Christ. But God had a, another purpose in him. And now that other purpose is going to be revealed. So you have this, you know, Paul's ministry has something that nobody ever dreamed about, but it also had a, a part of it that completed what was already revealed. Verse 5, verse, ver, verse 4, he says, Declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom, by this resurrected Christ... We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So today in the dispensation of grace, we have a ministry to all nations, to everybody. Now, if you're going to carry out your ministry to the nations, you need to understand in the Bible how God set the nations up to operate. If you're going to be a leader in ministry in the dispensation of grace, having a ministry to all nations, and you don't understand how the Word of God has designed, how God and His Word has revealed how He structured the nations to operate, what chance have you got really to carry on a ministry that's going to be effective? You follow that? Now that's something that is frankly quite missing in much ministry. If you're back over in Matthew 28 trying to figure out that, well, listen, you can spend the rest of your life in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and Acts 1 and John 20 with a flashlight and a sledgehammer, and you're not going to find any ministry that's going to help you do what God has to be done today. I'm sorry. You know that. Preaching to the choir about that. But when you become aware of that, and then you begin to do the work of the ministry as a grace believer... And then you act like that stuff over there is still where you're getting your information. What'd you do? Well, you just, <laughs> you, you didn't make the, tra to make the transition to Paul means I have to make a whole mental transition back to where Paul's ministry is. And now I'm going to, how did God, before he set up the nation Israel, design the nations to operate? That's where we are today. We're not in the situation that God designed the, na the world to operate when, when Israel was the head of the nations. So to understand, look, look with me in Acts 17. To understand what's going on there is critical. Acts chapter 17. Paul is speaking on Mars Hill to the Athenians. Acts 17 verse 24. God hath made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands, nor is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, breath, and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. That's the first thing you notice about dealing with Gentiles. We all came from the same dude. We all came from the same dirt. Now, you look around this room, you see, you, you, man, there's a lot of variety among us. But the first thing you know about when you deal with the Gentiles is one's not better than the other. And when you dealt with Israel, there was one nation better than everybody else, a favored nation. Okay? Now, they're still sons of Adam, and that sense not it, but God had given them favored status. There aren't any nations have favored status today. Now, see, probably half of you don't believe that. Probably half, two-thirds of you think America is a special nation because it's God's nation. 
You like old Sun Yun Moon? He thought Korea was, was was the promised land, you know. And he had about as much reason to think that as you. Now you need to be appreciative of your spiritual heritage. Understand that the that America, the United States of America, and our heritage, is the social impact of the spiritual life produced from the Protestant Refor Reformation, as Brother Ross calls it, the Protestant Revolution, which is a better description of it. But it has nothing to do with it being a Christian. There are no Christian nations in the world because God isn't building nations today to be his nation. So everybody's the same when it comes to that. So when I meet anybody out here, you know what I do? I look at those two kinds of people. There's lost people on their way to hell, and there's saved people on the way to heaven. He's made of all, you know, of one blood, uh, all nations uh, of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So he has made some some boundaries. We're going to look at that in a minute. But it has nothing to do with being any. Di why did he make boundaries? Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The picture there is that the world out there is like a bunch of blind folks stumbling around in a room trying to find something that they don't know where it's at. And when they pick it up, they don't know what they got. But he said, because you're, they're so blind and spiritually inept, he put them in small rooms so they got a better chance of finding something. Okay? So there's a reason he did what he did. Now, when did he do that? Well, he did that back in Genesis chapter number 11 at the Tower of Babel. All the world wants to be one world. What does he do? He, he scatters them. And what does he do? God never has to get in a sweat to take care of you and me. He just changed languages. You know... In our assembly on Sunday, we, we have probably about 15 different language groups. And, you know, they'll talk to me in English because they think that's what I speak. <laughs> and, and, but then you go down the hall, they'll be, they'll be talking, you know, something else. And over here, they'll be talking something else. And over here, they'll be talking something else among themselves, trying to figure out and explain to each other what I had said. <laughs> They don't have that problem with Brother Alex, by the way. He's, he's, he's smooth. But, you know, with me, that's a little, you know how it is. And, and you get divided up that way. It's easy to divide people up that way. As he did that, go, go back with me, if you will, to the book of Genesis. If you're going to understand the functioning, how the nations of the earth, God set them up, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis is where you're going to have to work. Now... In, in the FOD class, first, first year, we go through the first 15 chapters of Genesis. The purpose of that is to talk to you and give the doctrinal foundation from what I'm talk, to what, what I'm talking about now. I didn't do that just to teach. It's like Genesis 1. The first chapter of Genesis was not written to put the monkey on the run. It was not written to refute evolution. The first verse of the Bible destroys evolution. And if you can't get it destroyed in the first verse, quit trying to teach the rest of the verses and get people not to understand. It. You have a whole cottage industry ministry, people making millions of dollars off of going out telling people we're going to refute evolution and they're using science falsely so-called to do it. There are people right here in this room, you'd want to fight tooth and toenail about young earth, old earth, no earth, whatever. And it's, that's got nothing to do with what Genesis 1 is about. But you've been caught up into this religious stuff where we're going to go prove. Folks, there's a spiritual issue behind all of that. Romans 1 teaches you that. You need to be able to look beyond that and see what the real issues are. Okay? Well, Genesis does, does this, and those first 11 chapters of Genesis lay out, here's how God established mankind, the nations, ultimately makes them, that fourth institution, to operate. If you look at Genesis chapter 6, 
It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. When did they begin to multiply on the face of the earth? That's in Genesis 4, isn't it? Okay. So Genesis 6 is talking about here's what began to happen in Genesis 4. And daughters were, were, were born unto them, the sons, of, and the, the sons of God, so the daughters of men, and so on and so forth. What I want you to see is what took place in Genesis 6 is simply the culmination of a culture that began in Genesis 4. Genesis 4, Genesis 5, Genesis 6 is talking about that whole culture that was developed in the days of Noah, in the, in the time before the flood. This stuff didn't just happen when Noah was born. Noah is born at the end of a societal evolution. And you read down through Genesis 4 and you see the, the development of the culture. Enoch, Cain goes out. God says, you're gonna, you can't be a farmer anymore. You're going to be a vagabond. So what does Cain do? He says, I'm in rebellion against you. If you say I can't be a farmer anymore, okay, but I'll go build me a city. Call me Urbane. Let's lay some concrete. And he built a city. God said, don't build a city. You scatter. You're a vagabond. You have no certain dwelling place. The first city in the Bible built by man was built in absolute, complete rebellion against God. And every city since then that man has built has been a center for the spiritual rebellion against God. You know where they got the idea for building a city? From God. Where does God live? In a city. Genesis chapter number 1, Genesis chapter number 2. He finished, to me this is such a fascinating thing. In Genesis 2, then the heavens and the earth were what? Finished. Then God took in that finished creation and put a garden and put a man in the garden and said, go out and keep it finished. Think about that. God put man in a finished work and said, go keep it and dress it. Make it look good. Guard it. You see a parallel there? He put you in a finished work too, didn't he? Well, don't screw it up. <laughs> that next Sabbath, God had intended, had purposed, educated Adam in, in the idea what the Sabbath is about. He blessed it, sanctified it. When he finished that work... He said, I've made, my crea I've made the creation and now it's ready for what I created it for. And what's that? For him to bring his city down and dwell with man. But before that happened, man sinned. And the city couldn't come because of man's sin. Man has sought to, the adversary has sought to usurp the city ever since. And you go all the way to Revelation chapter number 18. Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. What is she? She's that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. She's not a physical city. She's the spirit of the city. goes back to Cain. Cain. See, there's stuff going on in the background that when you study the stuff, and I said I wasn't going to repeat all the stuff in the school, but, you know, I'm just calling to your mind some of the things we, we delve into. But you need to understand that spirit is there. It's what's underlying what's going on among the nations. So if you're going to minister to the nations, you need to understand what you're ministering to. There is a spiritual force of rebellion, not simply in individuals, but in the culture and the course of the world produced by those individuals. In Genesis 4, 5, and 6, you see the restoration plan that God has. Chapter 4, you see a picture of society that was, was that day. Chapter 5 in Genesis, you see the dispensational patterns. And chapter 6, you, you begin to see the, uh, the moral corruption that comes because of, of man's taking on himself. Then you come to after the flood, chapter 8, Genesis 8, 9, and 10, and 11, you see the new world. The, the real new world order, as it were. And he, he recommissions Noah in chapter 9. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's exactly what he told Adam. Just go out and... It's, it's like a new beginning. 
as it were. Now, he, rest he restates some things. He says, you don't, you're not a vegetarian and a vegan anymore. Now you're going to eat meat, but you've got to catch it. I'll put the fear of you, the dread of you. Why? So that man would be motivated to scatter. You know, I said last night my favorite animal is fried chicken. And that's a joke, but it's not really a joke. I can take you to some good fried chicken places around here. And you never had fried chicken until you had my wife cook it. So, you know, bacon grease makes everything better. <laughs> but you, you know how it is. If you Once you've had something like that and you say, now all I can eat is bean sprouts. You know. Can't we put just a little bacon grease in there? <laughs> we went to a place, a restaurant we like to eat at, and they have collard greens. Now I love greens. But when they serve you the greens, they ask you, you want them with turkey or ham? That's what I said. What? Turkey? You put turkey in collard greens? You put turkey in... Green bean? Are you nuts? Where'd you come from? And the lady says, well, you know, some people are diet conscious. I say, not very taste conscious. You know? <laughs> so you can understand what, what's going on with Noah here. Once you get a taste of it, uh, no, you, you, you get a, big, a good slab of nice fried bacon, and then they put that piece of turkey bacon up next to it. Well, that wouldn't even work either because turkey's still in the animal king. So all of a sudden they've added it, and it is a motivation to help them scatter because what they're supposed to do, scatter, replenish the earth. Don't be right here. So what does Nimrod do? He says, don't worry about it, dudes. Let's, let's build us a city. So he has the one world, the one language, the one city. We're studying the book of Jonah on Wednesday night. Not Noah, Jonah on Wednesday night. And one of the first things in the book of Jonah talks about Nineveh, that great city, that exceedingly great city. You know what Nineveh was? You know, there is a great city in the earth that God has. Jesus said, don't swear by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king, the adversary personified in the Assyrian, type of the Antichrist, has always been seeking to establish a rival city. It starts in Nineveh, migrates to Babylon, but it's the same crowd. So there's a lot of stuff going on back here that filters its way through the Gentiles. Through our, If we're ministering to the Gentiles now, you need to understand how the Gentiles work, how they operate. Is that, I want that to get across to you. I'm spending the time to make sure that you understand where I'm coming from. Because if you can't understand what's going on out there in the culture, you won't be able to understand the season of the culture because the culture is designed to operate seasonally. That's what happens in Genesis chapter 8. In Genesis 8, you see the cycles of national life. Genesis 9 and 10, you're going to see the purposes and, and the arrangement of the nations. He had defined the nations... Borders, language, and culture, Genesis 10. To have a nation, you have to have a language that gathers them together. Why? That's how he scattered us. When he scattered them according to the languages, they were to gather together based on the languages. That's what gathered them. When you get people gathered together, they begin to develop a culture, a similarity of culture and activity and they begin to locate in geographic locations where you establish borders around them for the protection of the people that are in. National borders, nationalism, is an extremely important issue because it provides the protection that Romans 13 says that human government is designed to provide. If you don't have secure, identifiable, defendable borders, you don't have a nation. Now, in our day... That, that's something 30 years ago you wouldn't have to said to, to Americans, but now you do. But you go back in, 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 the, in, the, in the 90s, in the, in the O's, back in the 90s, I remember in Africa, 
when Rwanda was, you remember the, 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 the slaughters and stuff in Rwanda? Half a million, there were 500,000 people went across the border in about a week and a half. I knew some people that were there as missionaries. And they said these people came running from the rebels and they came right across the border. The problem is they were going into a territory of people that didn't like them. The Hootsies and the Toot. <laughs> Hootsies and the Hutus or Hutus or whoever it was. I can't remember the, uh, the names always get confused in my head. But these different tribes. And the border was just obliterated. They're running. Why were they running over here? Because the people trying to kill them over here, they got across that border. They couldn't come over there because these people had an army that would put them out. And they had a definable place to go get defense. That's what mortars are for. It's not to say I'm better than you or not like you. It's to say, here, we, and you can keep wickedness out that way. You can also keep godliness out that way. But Genesis 11 defines a nation as borders, language, and culture. By the way, geopolitics, that is the politics of a region, is always the political apparatus of a region is primarily determined by the geography of the region. If you study geopolitics, you see that uh, that's consistently the case. A culture that is a culture on a seashore has a different kind of thinking and culture politically as a culture that's landlocked. That's what makes America, the United States, so unique. There are not many nations in the earth. In fact, there are no nations in the earth who have two large borders on both oceans. We have the West Coast and the East Coast. And that makes us quite unique. Now, there are a lot of countries that are on either coast, but not one that's the, all the way through. Canada would be the only one other like it. And it, it gives the, the politics a different kind of thinking process. I don't Maybe that means something to you, maybe it doesn't. But my point is that to understand what's going on, if you go into a culture, into a nation that has, you need to be able to look at it and figure that kind of thing out and to see the season that it's going to be in. In Genesis 8, if you just come down to verse number 20, I'm, I'm going to just cut to the chase here. Genesis 8, verse 20. Noah built an ark, an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Did you know that he didn't just take all the animals into the ark two by two? A lot of folks, you know, there are people that think that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> really, I, I, you know, I've talked to people like that. Jay Leno walking on the street or Waters World, that kind of stuff. Those, those are not the only dumb people in the world they talk to. It's amazing how, how dumb people can be about, about life, you know, navel-gazing. And, uh, you know, people walk around through life navel-gazing so hard you don't wonder they don't get a headache running into the, into the walls. My wife is a blonde. My, my, my kids used to bring blonde jokes home every, every day from school. My favorite one of all times. You heard about the two blondes that walked into the building? You'd have thought one of them would have seen it. <laughs> now, you guys that know my wife, it's a wonder that I still walk on two legs, isn't it? <laughs> he took... The clean animals, he took seven. Gets off, have an, has a sacrifice. The Lord smelled, a, verse 21, the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. See, that's where it came from. That thinking in Romans chapter 1 about... When the new God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You want to see what that gets you? Finish Romans 1, and you'll see that list of 23 evils that get filled up. You see, God made a creation, 
And he intended that creation to be filled with himself, with his thinking, with his will, with his life. And man said, I'll put, it, I'll put my will in my life. And man said, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I think I'll say, in the beginning, I created my world. And you know what it got him? It gets him what it, got, what it gets him when, it, when, when, when your thinking is the thing that dominates life. You live in a world, you need to understand the world you live in. They're seeking, they're empty vessels seeking to fill that vessel up with something that lasts and everything they put in it turns to smoke and mirrors. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity, says the preacher. Why? Because everything people try to answer the questions of life with don't work. Professing themselves to be wise, there are professors that think they're wise. Brother Morris Chestnut says, you know where you find professors. <laughs> Morris has got a farmer's wit about him. But the point is, Paul found him on, on Morris Hill. The point is, the truth of God's word is the issue, not all that stuff. And all that stuff that men look to to find answers is a smoke and mirrors. It produced the culture that produced the flood. Here's God's answer, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and winter, summer and cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So the way that the way the nations are going to operate is in a cycle. There's going to be a circle of life. It's going to start, it's going, to, it's going to have an axis like that. You're going to have cold, that's winter. Then you're going to have heat, that's summer. Then you're going to have spring, and then you'd have fall, harvest. You see how those things are? There are four. But you notice in the verse there are eight of them. And that used to trip me up. I used to try to think, what, what, why does he do eight of them when he could have just done four? And it, it, it finally it dawned on me as we've studied these things, this cycle of life that he designed the nations of the world, he designed humanity to operate on, your life as an individual operates that way. You start out... Zero to 20, childhood, right? You're a kid. You're acquiring values. You're acquiring knowledge. You're trying to grow up. 20 to 40, you're, we call that youth, young age. In that period, you've acquired some values. Now you're testing them and you're trying them. Now you're 40 to 60. 1 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60. That's when you're, you're in your power stroke. Now you're going to apply the values. You watch any culture, it's people 40 to 60 that run things. They're the most dangerous people in the culture. Then you go 60 to 80, I hope, because <laughs> that's where I'm at now. And that's what we call eldership. And what they do is they begin to transfer their values to the next generation. In our ministry here, I think often, I'll sit with our young men and in the late 20s, early 30s that are in our leadership, and I, I say to myself, I'm seeing them see me, and I want them to see themselves sitting where I'm sitting one day when they have their person sitting where they are. I don't just think about telling them what to do. I want to teach them to sit where I'm sitting and to decide and to choose and to make decisions and to understand how to teach that 20 or 30-year-old to ask the right questions, make the right decisions. That's leadership. Listen, guys, if you're going to be a leader in the work, it isn't just passing out tracks from the corner. Everybody does that, should do that. 
is not just winning someone to Christ or teaching them right division or having a Facebook page. It's being able to see the lay of the land, get the big picture, have the understanding, not just knowledge, but the wisdom and understanding to apply that knowledge in a bigger context and to really perceive where you are and what's going on. And if there's anything I want you to get as you go through Grace School of the Bible, I want you to get the grounding, the foundation, the, in, the information. And you know me, I'm willing to argue and fuss and cuss about any of it and have a good time doing it. I don't think I'm right about everything. In fact, I find myself wrong about more things all the time. I'm willing to grow, study, do all that. But getting all of the details... If you don't see the light, if you don't know whether, what season you're in, if you don't know if you're in the spring, the summer, the fall, or the winter, do you understand the differences between those seasons? What do you plant in the spring? We're going to plant corn. If you're in Illinois, you plant corn and soybeans. What do you what do you cultivate in the in the summer? What you planted? I planted. I planted soybeans. I get in the summer and say, you know, I, I'd, rather be, I'd rather be cultivating corn. Tough apples. You ain't cultivating corn. You know why? You planted soybeans. See, down, downstream, you don't get to make choices. You've got to deal with what's there. You know what you're going to harvest in the fall? Soybeans. Why? Because that's what you planted. But let me ask you a question. When did you decide to plant soybeans? You planted them in the spring. When did you buy the seed? When did you plan what fields you're going to put them in? That's what you did in the wintertime. You didn't just walk out there one morning and say, Well, I think I'll plant soybeans. Get the soybeans out, Fred. He said, We didn't order them. We didn't. No, we we got sunflowers. We don't have sorry. When did you order? You, you you understand what I'm saying? That's why this period right here is the most determinative of all the rest, because you're shedding what's here and deciding what's going to be there. You know where we are right now? We're right there in America. Right there. In our culture. If I want to know what's going to happen in the wintertime, look with me to Ecclesiastes. Where would you look to know what's going to happen in the wintertime? Rick and I left the house this morning. I got in bed last night about, 11, about 1 o'clock. And my wife said, well, I've got to be at church at 6.30 this morning. I said, well, bless God, hallelujah, enjoy yourself. <laughs> Roll me over when you leave. <laughs> and so I got up about 6.30 and got dressed, and Rick and I, he was standing with us, and we're riding here and made the comment about how we're not having much of a spring this year. Usually around here, in about two weeks, everything is a boom, pops out. It's wonderful, exciting. Not happening like that this year. We've got trees that have popped out, trees that are still sleeping. Uh, one right outside of my bedroom window, my wife and I look at it, I said, I wonder if it's dead. You know, usually it's already leaving out by now. And we're, we're afraid maybe it's dead. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, this is like last winter, last spring. We had a slow spring last year. But the one before that, boom, they came out beautiful. You know, it's always impressed me because being from Alabama, it wasn't that way. You know what you want? If you want to know what spring is going to be like, do you look at fall? What do you look at? Last spring. You've heard people say, you know, things go on the way they're going we're going to hell so fast you can't see us for the dust. But did you notice it never goes that way? You know why? There are three ways to compute time. There's a dot, a line, and a circle. All three of those are in Genesis. A dot. Right now, here it is. Chaotic time. There are cultures in the world who operate on dot mentality. That's why most of them are still what are called third world countries. Then there are cultures that operate on linear mentality. 
If I'm operating on dot mentality, I'm here right now. Did you ever go somewhere in the world? And they said, we're going to start at 8 o'clock. And about 9.30, the preacher says, well, maybe we ought to go on down to the church. <laughs> I thought you said 8 o'clock. Well, I won't be about there before 10. <laughs> well, see, that doesn't work for you. You, you, don't, you don't come from that kind of a culture. There's some of you that know what I'm talking about because there are cultures in the world that work that way. You know? And we call it whatever that culture is, time. That's the way they think about time. The ever-present. Is that a good way to think? You need to think about the now. Everybody ought to think all three ways. But if, all, if your main thinking is that, you never get anywhere. You're just always in the present. Then you have linear. I'm going to go from here to there. And if I'm going from here to there, let's get there in a hurry. You saw that little cartoon on Facebook the other day about the lady, with, and she's in bed, and her husband says, got to get up, got to get up. She says, no, no, my Fitbit's charging. I won't get credit for the steps. <laughs> <laughs> I went home last night, and my wife said, how many steps you got? And I said, well, I got about 5,200. She says, 8,000. I'm always behind. <laughs> Linear, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> Moving, that. you got cultures that are going places. I got a goal, I'm going. But you know the Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, There's a time, the, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. You know what that's telling you? It's not just all dots. It's not just lines. The reason... That never goes out. It's because the way man is worked, or the way you are designed to operate, do you think differently after you're 20 than you did when you were 10? When you get to be 40, do you think differently than when you were 20? Now, those of you that aren't 40 yet, the answer is yes. <laughs> and when you get to be 60, do you think differently than you did when you were 40? The answer is yes, yes. So in your adulthood, you continue to grow. And as you continue to grow, it, that's where the bend in the curve takes place. And so the culture is designed to reflect that lifespan. And that circle in a nation is the lifespan of an average human life, which is about 70 to 80 years. And that, that cycle... Now, in our culture, there have been seven of those life cycles... In, 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 in American culture. And it's fascinating to watch them, them go through. 1940, it's, this one is 46 to 62, 62 to 82, 82 to about two, 202, long in there. And this is 202 to 225. That's where we are right now. If you want to know what winter is going to look like, go look at the last winter. Don't look at the summer. That's the mistake people make. If you want to know what's coming, it's here. Every great awakening in American history has taken place in that springtime right there. Every great awakening in American history until the last one, that one, was based on some kind of biblical truth. The last one took place in my generation, right rhythm and revolution of the 60s. The last one was a new age awakening. I just explained to you what's going on out there. So what you need to do is understand that when you started out, when I started out, you could fill up Ladd Stadium in Mobile, Alabama with 50,000 people for a ball game or a Billy Graham crusade, and 80% of the people in the crowd believed the Bible's Word of God, whether they were saved or not. They knew it was God's Word. I've talked to bootleggers that knew the Bible was God's Word. God tell me, oh, guy used to tell me, call him Rep, Reprobate. <laughs> he loved that. He called me Rev. And I'd say, I'm not a reverend. He said, but I'm a reprobate. <laughs> And I'd talk to old Johnson and he'd say, my mama believes that Bible. I know that Bible says I'm going to hell, but I believe that, I believe that Bible's right. I know my mama, that preacher up here at that Methodist church, he don't believe nothing. 
That Bible was a lost guy. Got more sense than the guy preaching to the church up there. You fill that same lad stadium up with 40,000 people today. What's his name? Uh, guy running for president. Trump. He filled it up down in Mobile a couple months ago. I had relatives that went to it. Democrat relatives that went to it. And uh, that same crowd, 80% of them wouldn't care anything about the Word of God being the Bible. My relatives don't believe it's the, Bible, the Word of God. Your culture is different. That's the impact of that stuff right there. It works itself around. You need to understand where you are in the culture so that you can plan your ministry for the days ahead. I've been teaching this stuff in these meetings since the, since the late 90s. This is not new to some of you that have been around. Here's a book. It's called The Fourth Turning. This is the most present book I've ever seen about understanding American history. These are two lost guys. One of them's dead now. One was a, both college professors out in California. One's a sociologist, one's a psychologist. And they took an understanding of that. They didn't know what came out of the Bible. That understanding is reflected in every major culture on the planet. The reason for that is, is that's the way God set up the nations to operate. And if you are a thinking, analyzing person, and you analyze your culture, that's what you're going to come up with. That's the yin and the yang. Look at here. There's the yin, hot, cold, the yang. There's the opposite. There's the major shift, major shift, minor shift, the different thing. All these things cultures have. These guys took that information and traced it through American history. I, I tell you, you th we bought this off of, there's a few in the bookstore. We bought this off of Amazon. You can find them. They're still available although they're not being republished too much. If you're interested in it, I'd, I'd suggest you read the book. It's thick, it's academic, but it's, for those of you that have the ability to read that kind of stuff, it's very helpful. There are probably only half a dozen books like that that I've ever said that about. This is, this is probably one of the two secular books that I'd say that about. Tremendously helpful once you understand the doctrinal basis of it. Okay? You need to have that ability to do the seasonal thinking. So that you can understand your pathway through the culture. Now, you're going to have the right doctrine to preach. That's where you're preaching it. When we first started talking to you about this, we were here in the 90s. And I told you we need to get ready for the winter. Because here's where the decisions are going to be made that are going to set the sails for the future. Our culture has changed completely. Most Christians are still looking <coughs> in, the, in the past and don't see it. Any culture that can't define marriage has lost the foundations that produce the culture. And if the foundation be destroyed, what should the righteous do? Well, you hang on to your helmet is what you do. So what should you do? How do you function in it? You can go blindly through it thinking that I'm going to do the things that always worked in the past and have the truck run over you. Or you can understand where you are and understand that, that you're going to have to shed the things of the past, the form, and develop a new structure. Some of you men sitting right here are going to be, just because of your age, are going to be involved in forming the new structure of ministry in a world that is so different that I don't even know how to describe it to you. I want you to have the basics of understanding how to ask the right questions to get the right answers. Well, you got to get to, I'm, I'm trying just to get you this big, broad background so that you can live on purpose. So that you can walk circumspectly, not as fools, understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's why it's critical to understand how God guides you, how God leads you, 
you know, I pound on that with you because that's critical to understand. And if you're still trying to get this charismatic leading of Israel's program, you're going to wind up running into the wall. But if you'll use the wisdom, understanding, and, and, and knowledge that God gives you through His Word, rightly divided, you'll be equipped to deal with it. It's just boring. Okay. Is it confusing? I hope not. Well, I didn't give but one no on that one. <laughs> Our ministry philosophy, frankly, is very simple. We're not trying to build a... This is one of the reasons I don't believe in building organizations and hierarchies beyond the local church. Why would you need to have to be answerable to someone outside of your local area when the whole way it's designed to operate is through you functioning where you are? Every community has these things in it. That's why it's got, it's got the, the more than the, 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 the eight of them instead of the four. The ministry philosophy is real simple. Just expose and win people to Christ. Get some people saved. You know what will happen if you get somebody, you want to do somebody to the Lord? They'll let you teach them the Bible. Most of the time. So build them up in the faith. Train them to minister effectively to others. And then send them to repeat the cycle with others. That's the deal. That's what we're about. That's what our ministry is. We're not kingdom building. We're not machine building. We're not organization building. We're doing the work of the ministry. So what do you need to do it? I told you back in the 90s, the essential elements. You need a well-organized plan. You need clear training that can be easily passed on to others. You need materials to accomplish it. And then you need unity among those that are doing it. And those are the things you need in your ministry, where you are. Now, we're going to take a break and come back. We've got two more sessions. We're going to take a 15-minute break. I know some of you have drunk a lot of coffee. You need to go take care of that. This stuff's in the back back here. It's still back there and so forth. If you need to wet your whistle. When we come back, we're not going to take it. We'll have two sessions, but we won't take just a stretch break between them, Okay. Okay, when you hear the music, come back. It'll be at 1030. Well, she asked me that. Or, well, you were standing when she I'm asked me. Standing. She asked yeah. me, you're 5,500. And she said, she ran in the other room. She came back and said, mine's over. Okay. I, I just, you last time. You got four words. It's back to her. We're going to ask you to start the next session. Yeah. I think every day is the last day of it, so I don't know what it's going to be. I think we're living the last days of America as we've grown. So, but America doesn't reflect the whole world. It doesn't reflect us. So I don't, I, I don't know how to gauge the culture and decide that. I just know that in the scripture, you know, every day is going to be the last day. So I, I take the mentality, yeah. You have to be busy, and that's my point. And this is, you need to know where you are in the cycle of your nation, so that you can be effective in doing this. Thing. That's right. The main thing. I gave it to you. Question. Eighty-two in two thousand one year. Two thousand one. Okay, I have a 